Muito bom dia ou quase boa tarde a todos. Uh, o meu nome é Margarida Couto, uh, eu sou advogada, sócia da Vira da Almeida e Associados, uh, mas sou também, e é um bocadinho também nessa qualidade que aqui estou, presidente do Grace, que é uma associação uh, que representa as empresas portuguesas que têm os temas da sustentabilidade e da responsabilidade social uh, como centrais às suas uh, preocupações. Nós hoje temos um painel dedicado à sustentabilidade da nossa sociedade, Uh, quem, enfim, esteve nesta conferência ao longo dos últimos dias, com certeza que já foi ouvindo em como o papel das empresas tem que mudar na sociedade uh, e em como é importante para que se possam atingir os, ob os objetivos de desenvolvimento sustentável, que as empresas compreendam que o seu papel na sociedade mudou e que não, não devem servir apenas os seus acionistas, mas todos os seus uh, stakeholders. Uh, aliás, quem teve a oportunidade ontem de manhã na abertura de, de ouvir a, a Laila Pollock, uh, ela disse, e faz todo o sentido, que a lista de tudo os mais importantes do mundo neste momento são os Objetivos de Desenvolvimento Sustentável. E o que uh, hoje nós vamos ver aqui é, através de casos reais, como o advento da quarta revolução industrial, como a inovação, como a tecnologia e como o digital, são verdadeiramente os enablers que vão poder sustentar toda esta transformação e que vão poder, no final do dia, ajudar as empresas a ajudar a salvar o planeta. O nosso primeiro orador e keynote speaker é, é o Kwame Ferreira. Uh, o Kwame é, é português, daí o Ferreira. Kwame não é tão óbvio que seja português, mas é. Uh, é um criativo líder da Impossible Labs. É cofundador de diversas startups. É um problem solver tudo através de soluções digitais e ele acredita profundamente que o que não é bom para o planeta não é bom para as pessoas. E apesar da empresa dele se chamar Impossible, acho que vamos todos perceber que pelo menos para ele não há impossíveis. Come, the stage is yours. Obrigado. Thank you. Ok, so I'm supposed to stand here. Um, eu vou falar em, em inglês, mas eu falo português. Mas vou fazer isto em inglês, porque estão aqui pessoas em inglês. So I'll, 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 I'll take this in English. Um, thank you. Um, the story I have to tell you today is one that starts with this, with this slide, planet-centric design. Um, I've been a designer most of my adult life. Um, and I run a crazy group of people who... Um, What they do is they go from problem to product to business, right? So we create products ultimately and hope that those products become um, successful businesses. When we do that, um, we usually use um, methodologies such as design thinking or lean methodologies mostly that come from Silicon Valley and the West Coast. Um, and our thesis uh, for, for some time now is that design thinking um, is at the problem of, as at the core, pro, is the core problem of what we're facing right now um, when we go from problems to products to businesses. Um, and the reason why that is so is because when you, when you create products, you cr we, we've become so good at creating sexy, highly addictive um, experiences and products, digital or physical, that the, 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 the user um, is pampered to the very limit of what the planet can actually sustain. So what we've been doing is um, we put the user at the center, um, the person at the center of the creative process, and we go, um, so what would you like? Well, I want some food in... Um, 10 minutes. Um, okay, so press this button and you have food that comes to you in 10 minutes. The same goes for taxis. The same goes for, uh, um, for a whole bunch of, of services that we engage on a daily basis. So this convenience culture 
is a culture that by putting the, the, the user at the very center of the creative process um, is disregarding the big picture. Um, so the, the big picture for us is that we cannot um, create for individuals anymore. We need to create for communities. And the reason why we need to create for communities is once you create for communities, you are, um, you, you, you are embracing um, system thinking. You are, it's your service or your product is going to have advocates, is going to, is going to be uh, repaired, it's going to be resold, upsold, cross-sold within the community. Um, and so we've, we believe very vehemently in not um, honing in on the user anymore, but really thinking about um, communities when we create um, products that then become businesses. Um, this graph uh, that you see up here, um, there are actually two graphs. So on the one, on the one side, um, you have the exponential growth that um, we um, as startup um, makers and, and creators um, look up to. It's like, oh, wouldn't we love that every every problem that we're solving, converting into a product, has an adoption rate very similar to that curve on the left. That would be great. But the problem with this paradigm of just thinking about growth can actually be seen on the graph to the right. Oh, I'm on the wrong slide. <laughs> you didn't say anything. You had to say something. Um, so on the left, you have like, the, the, the Silicon Valley paradigm of infinite growth, right? And on the right, you have what's actually been happening with our planet. So um, they, if you, they kind of match, right? Um, and we don't really have a problem with growth, but it can't be at the, at the center of the creative process. So at the center of the creative process is really... Um, this, this idea of balance, which is not new. We have to create and design for balance in order to achieve growth. Otherwise, we won't be able to, uh, to sustain life as we know in this planet. And it's very much a struggle between, um, between the human sphere and the biosphere, and it doesn't have to be. I think we can actually find um, balance. So the world we inhabit is one where we we don't really talk about ideas, we talk about problems, um, and we go from problems to products to business. Now, if you just talk about problems, you, um, you, you stop seeing the big picture. And that is the problem with design thinking, and it's a, lot, it's a huge problem with, with the lean methodology. Um, that's coming out of, uh, uh, out of Silicon Valley. So what we decide to do is swap problems for goals. Um, if you set, if you're able to convert your, um, your customer problems into real goals, um, you are able to align your company, your product, and then your company, because it's like a, a, a chain that is, that is inevitably going to impact the business um, with higher purpose um, goals, with, with goals that were created by people who, are, um, from, who come from 193 nations around the world, and they've set these goals for everyone. And these goals, there are 17 goals right now for 2030. I'm sure you've heard of them. Um, Davos last week was just covered, plastered in this kind of tutti frutti um, co um, collage. Um, they, they are goals that we really need to align with when we create products um, and when those products scale to then become businesses. Um, it's really important to look at these goals from a um, to understand these goals, because 17 is really a lot. It's like, who came up with 17? Why weren't they like five or three? Like, I can take three, but you know, 17, really? Which one is like six? And uh, why must we focus on goal 13? So the, 
at the end of the day, it's like a layered cake. There's uh, there's four main goals that you that we really need to work towards. Otherwise, there's no planet, um, and that's you know clean water. And we'll, you'll hear a lot about water in this panel. Um, it's definitely 13 carbon. We won't be able to breathe. Temperatures rising. Um, when when kid when we have a fever, like I mean, with two extra degrees, the human body already has a fever, right? Now, can you imagine that scenario at a planetary level, right? So it's we we really need to start thinking about meeting these goals um, ASAP. And then there's also biodiversity um, and. Um, I talked about clean water and then it's live, live in the oceans. And there's a panelist over here that will talk about that. Um, so at the end of the day, we need to solve for the planet. So yes, it all starts very viscerally. I want to press this button and I want a, I want the car outside. I want my eclair to come to me right now. There's some lovely eclairs here. I wish I could have a button and just like, can you bring me one? Um, they can't hear me because this is a silent um, show. Um, so the, it's great to solve viscerally for customer problems, but you very quickly need to wrap that into, um, into bigger problems. Um, and those bigger problems have, defined, have been defined for us. They're the SDGs, um, and, uh, and we need to do that. And so it looks very much like, if we, it looks very much like you see up here. You can't just focus on the user. You need to go all the way up to the planetary level. Um, a couple of examples of how we've done this. So the company I run um, is called Impossible. Impossible really stands for I am possible. The domain name is pretty cool, so we kind of go, okay, impossible.com. Um, and we're really trying to make this possible by um, not only engaging with some really big corporations and giving them our advice, but also creating our own businesses. So Fairphone is something that we helped get off the ground. It's a phone that when you think about it from a pitching perspective, it's a phone that's trying to last as long as possible in your pocket. Um, so you don't have to replace it all the time. But it's also looking at the supply chain and, and trying to figure out along that supply chain, what can we change in order to meet some, some, some planetary goals, right? So it's very planet centric. Um, in that respect, um, the and it goes all the way. I don't know if you remember that that graph, the, the previous graph. The it's when we talk about planet centric, it's not just you know right away. It feels like we're just saving whales and seals and like pine trees and forests. No, it it's about community, right? And it's about sinking in. And community can start in your neighborhood, and then it gets a bit wider and gets a bit wider. So it's, it's about when, when we did Fairphone, it, we really looked at the factories and whether they, those people are happy and whether they're engaged um, and whether they're fairly treated. So it's about people. If we don't treat each, we need to treat each other the way we want to treat our planet. It's how we treat each other is how we treat our planet. John Francis said that. Uh, he has a wonderful TED talk about it. The second business we have, and this is with a, it's the first business where we actually got Silicon Valley money for it from a couple of really big VCs, is we, try, we, we wanted to make eyewear. Eyewear is very wasteful industry. How do we make eyewear with a lot less waste? Um, and, and so we created wires. I'm wearing a pair. Um, the, the idea here is just one wire. It's 3D printed in bean paste, so PA11. The, the lenses are bioplastic. It is possible to still have cool looking eyewear. If you want a conservative pair, we can, we can, we can get that for you um, and, and run a very viable business. Uh, but we do need to think of the plan. Uh, we do need to think about the planet at the very start of the creative process. Otherwise, you get to the, you get to the end. We're like making a lot of money. And now, okay, now we're going to offset. We're going to give some to charity. Um, and, and that type of thinking has gotten us into this mess. So I can't stress enough that when you create products, when you start anything, startups, um, 
that is going to that the, the mindset shift is what's going to create the company of the future and you don't want a company looking back and kind of having to pay for their sins um, lastly is a this is a one of our success stories so it's a company called bond and the idea behind it's very simple we, it's a bracelet it comes in pairs you give it to your loved one you touch it and your loved one feels it right very simple um, we did this because we were really tired of looking at screens and you know you've seen digital pro uh, physical products here but most of our focus is actually digital and a lot of the problems we face today are about this digital distraction loads of mental health issues around anxiety and whatnot so uh, this was a very simple way of because we're always traveling we have studios around the world and instead of going oh i have to okay i already told her i loved her i loved her yesterday i'm gonna what am i gonna say today oh, i really 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 love you um and so rather than do that just just a, a simple touch so we can simplify technology um, and and make it much more um, much more human and in the process I guess planet centric um, you see the those little squares for every single company we do we try and align it with a few SDGs and then we have methodologies through which that we through which we're able to measure that uh, some of which imply being a B Corp and being independently audited um, every um, every two years. Um, that's me with 15, min 15 seconds to spare. Um, impossible. Thank you. Obrigado, Kwame. Uh, vamos agora ouvir o, o Rui Miguel Nabeiro. O Rui Miguel Nabeiro dispensa apresentações. That way. Deste lado. Uh, sim. <risos> o Rui Miguel Nabeiro dispensa apresentações, mas eu tenho que apresentar na mesma. Uh, julgo que todos sabem, é CEO da Delta. Em Portugal, toda a gente conhece a Delta e eu costumo dizer que a Delta é uma empresa que nasceu absolutamente alinhada com os SDGs antes dos SDGs sequer se chamarem SDGs. Uh, e além disso, a Delta faz aquele café fantástico que tomamos todos lá fora, Rui. Já agora. Eu já agora. Rui. Não sei se me estão a ouvir, como eu não ouço, ok? Obrigado. Bom, oh, well, I, I'm doing it also in English. Um, first of all, thank you very much for this invitation. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here and being able to listen to so such a fantastic sharing that we had, being inspired by what others do and of course sharing a little bit of our story and how we see and do things. So a lot of people in our days see business as a problem. But what if business are really the solution? When a business solves a problem, it takes profit. Profit allows it to grow and again solve another problems. And that's how business work. This is why to create a sustainable society, we need sustainable businesses. We have to create social value to impact the lives of our employees, of our customers, of our community and the environment. So we need to balance the economic and social value. Rapid, constant and disruptive change is now the norm and what happened in the past is no longer a guide to what will happen in the future. So the next five years, the speed of change will be really more fast than the previous 20 years. If we want to stay in business, we need to learn how to adapt to constantly dynamic ecosystems in ways that unleash fresh energy, innovation and commitment. This is the only way to really stay in the game. As leaders, we need to create true learning organizations centered on people, and our biggest challenge is to help, to help our people to reinvent themselves. So for us, innovation is really the drive for a more sustainable planet and to survive in the ecosystem. Let me share with you how do we do innovation and how do we face all the, the, the challenges that we have ahead. So the first way that we look at innovation and 
this problem solving is through co-ideation. What is co-ideation for us? So we created an ecosystem inside our company uh, based on a platform we call Mind, where everybody can share, share their ideas, help with challenges that we face, all kinds of challenges. And it's through this platform, which works online and offline because it's a community that we solve our problems, that we allow people to be challenged and to help create new products, new solutions and new ideas. An example of that is products that came out of this pipeline, like coffee, like go chill, slow coffee, sweet coffee, it's a sweet coffee without sugar. So we are looking at the challenges. We're, cha we're challenging our community and inside the community, we get the solutions. This is co-ideation. I have a video to show you a little bit about that. Antecipar o futuro, criar valor, novo conhecimento e estimular a inovação. Este é o Mind, o um modelo proprietário de inovação da Delta. O objetivo? Gerar novas experiências de consumo, novos produtos, serviços e modelos de negócio. Confrontamos insights com as áreas de crescimento estratégico do Grupo Nabeiro. Traçamos cenários de inovação para o universo Delta. O Mind é um modelo human-centered, feito de pessoas, com pessoas e para pessoas. Todos os anos são selecionadas as melhores ideias de negócio para serem trabalhadas como oportunidades a lançar no mercado e validadas no Delta Mind Lab. O espírito empreendedor dos colaboradores é posto à prova. Os parceiros contribuem para a aceleração das ideias. Os consumidores e clientes são chamados a validar a proposta de valor. São quatro meses de intensos bootcamps, várias sessões de trabalho multidisciplinar. No pitch final, as ideias são apresentadas em sete minutos a um exigente júri externo em ambiente Shark Tank. Este é o um momento alto da inovação do grupo. Todos os anos, no Delta Mind Lab, aceleramos as 10 melhores ideias. Desafiamos 60 pessoas de várias áreas a desenhar o seu modelo de negócio. A equipa vencedora embarca num tour de inovação a uma capital europeia. Os participantes têm contacto direto com hubs de inovação, startups, academias, aceleradoras e scale hubs. A inovação acontece agora. A inovação somos todos nós. O futuro é de todos. So, the second way that we that we operate is through cooperation. We work through cooperation when we don't have the knowledge, enough knowledge inside of our home with our people to solve the problems, to achieve our goals. So, what we what we do is combine knowledge with others with institutions with uh, with universities with other and different companies that will help us solve the problems and help us achieve our goals a good example of this it's the bio capsule that we just put out in the in the market we work with seven different organizations that help us achieve what we needed it's a bio capsule <coughs> 100% biodegradable, made of sugarcane and mandioca, and it wasn't possible to achieve such a fantastic product if it wasn't done together with others out of our company. The third way that we operate is through co-creation. So co-creation means that the innovation potential does not stop at the boundaries of our company. So we look for external knowledge who can be synergic to the business and who is aligned with our values. This is the reason why we work together with startups. So the idea of working with startups that can bring value into our ecosystem is really to accelerate wisdom. We genuinely want to make our resources, our knowledge available to startups. We want to grow together. So again, the way that we look at the future and that we embrace our challenge is three different ways. Co-ideation, co-operation, and co-creation. We need innovation to be sustainable. Focusing on people and the planet 
is the only way to a growing business. The flux, how we call it, is not only a physical one, the massive transformation in climate and economy, but especially it is a flux of human experience that we're living in. We must increasingly supplement our industry and functional expertise with a general capacity for learning, for improving. We must challenge that capacity with our people to build a more agile and robust ecosystem. We need to engage our people, and this is the only going to happen if they believe in us. If our own people believe in what we are doing, if they believe in our purpose. We want to create good business. And I think that NAM, and I asked Nathan to join me here today, is a good example of how we collaborate with startups. So, Nan, can you share a bit more about what sure. you're doing together? Sure. I give you the clicker. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a good example of collaboration. I was in charge of the clicker. Now, yeah. Louis Miguel is in charge of my clicker. Hi, I'm Nathan. I'm the founder of NAM. And what we do at NAM in two words is that we upcycle coffee waste into delicious and edible mushrooms. We humans were so clever that we are the only species on Earth that managed to invent waste. Because if you think about it, waste does not exist in nature. What is waste for one becomes energy for the other. And that's why I decided to create NAM. Because I, I think that waste is only waste because we decided to see it as waste. But it's actually not a problem. It's an opportunity to create more value with what is locally available. At the end of the day, waste is nothing more than an economic inefficiency of our system. And as every entrepreneur knows in this room, when you have an ec in economic inefficiency, you have an opportunity for business. So let me tell you a bit more on how we go from waste to taste at NAM. Obviously, it starts with a good coffee. It's better if it's a Delta coffee, because that means that Delta is going to come collect the waste that is generated by your coffee, bring it at our urban farm in the center of the city. There, we're going to transform it into mushrooms. And then we're going to sell those mushrooms to restaurants. That is the first cash flow that we create out of the coffee waste. The second cash flow comes from the leftover from the mushroom production. Because luckily, the leftover from our mushroom production makes an excellent fertilizer that we then sell to local farms to grow their own um, fruits and vegetables. But better than words, let me show you a little video that Rui Miguel and I did uh, about the partnership between NAM and Delta. Thank you. What if you could use something that nobody uses and turn it into something that everybody needs? My name is Nathan, I'm 24 years old and I'm from Belgium. The more time I spend here in Portugal, the more I realize how much coffee is essential to their culture and how much it is part of their everyday life. I truly believe that if you look closely enough and use your imagination, you can discover the full potential of things that surround you. We know that in nature, waste does not exist. What is waste for one becomes energy for the other. And this is also true with coffee. Coffee waste makes an excellent substrate to grow mushrooms. And this is what NAM is about. Upcycling coffee is part of the solution to fight climate change. Once collected, we mix it with mushroom seeds and a bit of straw. You can imagine that uh, growing mushrooms is not uh, an easy thing to do, and especially inside the city, so not uh, many people uh, allow it. So it's not easy to find a place, actually. But I kept knocking on every door, and finally I found that really cool space in Largo da Intendente. six weeks the process transformed coffee into fresh and tasty oyster mushrooms. Then we harvest the mushrooms and we sell them to local cafes and restaurants. I'm always so amazed with what the chefs can do with the mushrooms. 
as a circular business model, the idea is not to only grow mushrooms, but to not create any waste in the process. And the leftover can be used as a fertilizer for local farms. This, to me, really shows the full potential of a business model that is able to reconcile economy and ecology. After one year of developing my ID, I had a chance to meet with Rui Miguel. Eu sempre cresci num ambiente que se preocupa com a sustentabilidade. A Delta, como empresa, sempre teve naqueles seus pilares importantes a sustentabilidade, porque nós precisamos realmente nos preocupar com o nosso planeta e de montarmos negócios que se preocupem a ir buscar, reutilizar e voltar a dar. A relação nossa com a NAMA é exatamente neste pilar da sustentabilidade e do pilar económico. E por isso interessou-me muito o, o projeto. Acho que tem muitos méritos uh, e estou certo que serão um enorme sucesso. Cada vez mais todas as gerações que vêm têm que se preocupar e dar um exemplo. E dar um exemplo e, e sobretudo, mostrar o caminho. The approach we try to have at NAM is to stop criticizing and start building solutions for the future. So what we want to do is not fighting the old, but building the new. Bom, uh, como podem, <laughs> como podem ver, Javier, Javier, this way. Como podem ver, este, este exemplo da, da Delta com a NAM uh, é não apenas um exemplo extraordinário de, de sustentabilidade, de economia social, uh, mas também de cumprimento do Objetivo 17, que é aquele que nos manda colaborar uns com os outros uh, e deixarmos de nos ver como competitors e passarmos a vermos como co-petitors e com isso alcançar soluções que são tão óbvias e tão simples uh, se as quisermos alcançar. Uh, e é isso também que o Javier uh, faz. O Javier Cardoso é Managing Director e Country Manager para a, Irébio, para a Ibéria do Ecolab, uh, que é uma empresa global de tecnologias e serviços de, essencialmente que cria soluções tecnológicas para o aproveitamento e evitar o desperdício ao nível da água, uh, da energia, segurança alimentar. Uh, mas ele vai nos explicar pelo, pelo por ele próprio, o que é que a Ecolab faz uh, em benefícios dos Objetivos de Desenvolvimento Sustentável. Obrigado, Javier. Ele é espanhol, mas percebe o que eu estou a dizer. Espanhol, não falo português. So I will make it in English. I'm very happy to be here and very nice connection to what Nathan was saying about human being the only element in the planet that creates artificial waste. Because I want to talk about water, something that we cannot waste. So why I want to talk to you about water? And I, I want to also link what Kwame was saying, and he was opening it up to me very nicely, about being one of the four strategic development goals that we really need to care about, clean water. And we have to look a little bit at the past. In the past, 10 years ago, we, did we care about water? Did we talk about water? Because hey, two thirds of the planet are made of water, so is this something to worry about? But today we are, we, I think we came to a realization. Like w one day I wake up and realize that, where did my hair go? I used to have a lot of hair, believe it or not, and now it's all gone. The same happened with the water. Where is the water going? Out of these two thirds, you need to think that 2.5% of the water in the planet is usable for human needs. That's sweet water, 2.5. If you take out the glaciers and you think lakes, rivers, or underground water, you are down to 1%. And that's what we have. And there is no new water. Nobody's creating water out of the blue. So what we have is there. What we have, we are already using it. So that's the challenge that we now realize. And this is not somebody else's problem, meaning in Europe, we, we don't have to worry. Because another interesting fact is that half of the population in Europe lives in areas of high risk of water scarcity. And you can imagine Portugal, like Spain, we are in that list, quite high in the list because of our climate. So we, we all need to worry about, and we all are doing nice things about it. So the presentation is about the challenge, also the opportunity that, that I want to talk to you about. And one of the realizations is what we have is what we need. 
and we're going to need 40% more in the next 10 years. In the same way that we are going to need more food, more energy, and the message here is all these things are interconnected and we cannot look at them in isolation. And maybe there is a reason why SDG 6 is about water, SDG 7 is about energy, because they are really connected and I will talk to you more about how and why they are connected. I put a nice picture of Lisbon because uh, one thing that is interesting and you will never think about is that the most water stressed city in Europe is London. It's not here in Iberia or, or in Greece, it's, it's London. And the second is Brussels because of the high demand and, and the low, low availability. Lisbon is also a high risk place. And here, you, you can, people local, you can be quite proud because I was doing some research and I realized that Lisbon set for itself a 2020 target of being highly water efficient, which means less than 20% of water losses in the city. And we are already at 9% today, starting 2020. So very proactive approach to, to the needs of, of Lisbon. Another interesting fact is that when we look globally, Agriculture is a major water user in the world, but we are in the first world, what we call the first <coughs> or industrialized countries. Europe, North America, that is reversed. And industry takes more than double of the water that is used for agriculture. So industry plays a major role, and that's what we do, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. Because we should not forget that domestic is still 10 or 15% of the total. And domestic is something that we all can do something about. So we need to keep staying shorter in the shower, we need to keep fixing the, that little tub that maybe is dripping, and that's our contribution and also our consciousness. But a lot to do is in the industry. And to give you examples, it takes 600 liters of water to produce one liter of beer, when you look at the whole supply chain. It takes 200 liters to make one cup of coffee. And we are also improving there. And it takes up to 1,500 liters to produce a car. Of these industries that I mentioned, all of them are working on it. I have to say, beer is the one where we see much strong proactive approach and they have reduced more than 60% their water use in the last 10 years. So a lot going on in these industries. And I mentioned the, the, the nexus. Let's call it the water energy nexus or how strongly these things are interconnected. It takes a lot of water to produce energy. Conventional power production, it needs a lot of water because you need to produce steam to, to move the turbine that generates electricity. And that's in conventional production, which we still need a lot of. And also, if you look at the cities, the treatment of the water and the pumping of the water that we need to our houses, it takes 20 to 40 percent of the total electricity demand of, of a certain city. So it's a lot. And if you look at the industries, as I said, we use a lot of water. 70 percent of that water is needed for heat transfer, for heating processes that need temperature or for cooling the water after the process, 70%. So every time we optimize a heat exchanging process, we are minimizing water and we are improving energy efficiency. So that's how industry can play. And here, the, the good news is that we talk to a lot of industries, 82% of the industries we talk to, they have clear sustainability goals, water reduction goals, aligned to their sustainability agenda. The not so good news is that 75% of them, they don't have a clearly articulated strategy and plan to achieve that goal. So, so how can that be? They, they know the goal, but it's difficult to find a way to achieve it. First, it costs money. So money is what moves the world and not water. And, and second, all the, we can say, low hanging fruit that was out there has already been collected. So we need to think in a different way. And that, that's we can call reduction with a capital R. So 
talking about setting targets between 20 and 90 percent of water reduction and I started to think about this concept of GLD, zero liquid discharge, that, that is going to come, zero, zero waste. And if we think about how to achieve that, I want to go back to the talk of Lila Poking yesterday, which was very inspiring, and she talked about innovation, and she <coughs> said, we do innovation to improve the past, we do innovation to augment the future, and we do innovation to invent the future. And, and that's the one is needed because the other ones, as I say, are low-hanging fruit. So this inventing the future that, that she called, she called uh, mutating innovation, I think is what we're trying to do. Meaning that there are capabilities out there in different countries, different companies, consultants, energy or uh, engineering. What we are doing is putting all these capabilities together, engineering, chemistry, expertise, digital, operating, into one basket, into one solution from which we can then innovate. And that didn't exist before. That's what I want to call mutating innovation. And, and the good news is that thanks to digital revolution, we can do things that we could not do before. We can do these things better. We can do things faster. And we can connect this. Every, every month, we looked at it recently, every month we receive more than 2 billion single data points from our customers installation. We have 36 customers where we treat the water around the world. So they will generate 2 billion data points every month. So the fact of having them real time available in the Azure cloud, connected to people that can do something about this, this is an enabler. This is a big enabler that then we can work proactively on projects. We can optimize processes continuously and we can minimize risk because risk is one of the big obstacles of doing big water recycle projects. So what happens is something goes wrong. That's a big risk. So having access to real-time data and proactive approach to prevent issues minimizes risk and makes people more comfortable to go forward. Finally, we did this in a steel plant to, to make it easier to understand. The plant is in a place where water scarcity, high water cost. So we reduce 80% of the water demand which is 1,400 million liters per year, or equivalent to a modern city of 30,000 people, just to get the idea, with the energy savings and the cost savings that come with it. So energy saving because there is a caloric content of the water that we recycle that then we can utilize. So it's circular economy fully. So I want to finish with a nice Japanese saying that I really like, which is don't wait until you're 30 to build a well, which relates to water, but relates also to many things in our life. Like, uh, I see a lot of young people here, but pension plan is something that makes you think about as well. <laughs> so, thank you for that. Muito obrigada, Miguel. E agora passo a palavra ao Miguel Matos. O Miguel Matos pode parecer o nosso orador anticlimax, porque vem da indústria tabaqueira, mas é um bom exemplo de como não há indústria nenhuma que não, pode, que não se possa transformar Uh, rumo à sustentabilidade. Obrigada, Miguel. Obrigado, Margarida. É um prazer estar aqui. De facto, pode parecer um pouco improvável como é que uma empresa de tabaco está a falar aqui sobre sustentabilidade. Nós estamos a falar da Philip Morris International, que é a maior empresa multinacional de tabaco, e em Portugal a tabaqueira, que é uma das maiores empresas portuguesas, uma das maiores exportadoras portuguesas. Mas, de facto, nós estamos a passar momentos de transformação a muitos níveis. Uh, e se nós virmos o que, o que se passou nos últimos anos... 52% das empresas, das maiores empresas do mundo, desapareceram do top das maiores empresas que eram há uns anos atrás. Isso, ou seja, as empresas de petróleo, as empresas de grandes bancos, etc., foram substituídas por empresas de tecnologia, por empresas que revolucionaram as indústrias de fora e conseguiram, de facto, ganhar o seu espaço. E nós pensámos, obviamente, uma empresa de tabaco, se nós um, nós, existem mais ou menos mil milhões de fumadores no mundo uma em cada sete pessoas no mundo fuma uma em, uma em cada sete pessoas que está aqui provavelmente é fumadora e se nós perguntarmos a estas pessoas qual é a sua principal preocupação provavelmente e aos seus amigos e à sua família uh, maybe I should change to English I forgot, <laughs> sorry I'll switch to English uh, but if so, there, there's one out of seven people that is, uh, that is a smoker in the world so if you ask what is their main concern 
actually probably is health related uh, issues with tobacco. So our main contributors at tobacco company is can we solve, can we be a contributor, a positive contributor to the health related issues with tobacco products? And this is our main challenge and this is why we had to change and this is why we um, we had our CEO International saying this uh, fantastic statement, which is, we want to stop selling cigarettes. Uh, that's our target. So our vision is to have a smoke-free world and we want to stop selling cigarettes. And can you imagine how, how shocking this is for a company who only produces cigarettes? It's a, I mean, it's a shock, I would say, for the society, what do we mean by this, and even for the companies, because we, for example, in Portugal, we only produce conventional cigarettes today. But our vision is really to stop to sell uh, conventional cigarettes. And I will explain why. Basically, it's all about sustainability. Sustainability is key part of our transformation. And we have several pillars of, our, of, our, of sustainability. The first one is transforming our business. And this is the main one about the harmfulness of tobacco products. And then, of course, we have all the others that are the how we treat uh, other people, what are the social, the social relations we have with others, and, of course, the environmental footprint that we discussed here. But I want to focus more on the product. We developed, we invested a few decades ago. So we, we changed, let's say, our vision in 2015, but this started much before. We invested $6 billion up to date in R&D in, in Neuchâtel, in Switzerland. More than 500 scientists uh, coming from life sciences using uh, uh, methods uh, inspired in pharmaceutical industry, in the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in the US to come up with products that are better for people. Surprisingly, actually, we are one of the companies that are more patents uh, registered, uh, which is not something you would expect in a tobacco company. But what did we find out? Basically, we found out that the big issue with tobacco, with cigarettes, is in burning. By burning tobacco, you have thousands of toxics that are inhaled by the smoker. And if you remove the burning, for example, if you heat it instead, if you remove the burning, actually, you can reduce these toxics by 95%. And this is a, a very important finding because there's a lot of confusion also in media and uh, there's lots of news, and I'll touch a bit of that later. Nicotine is not risk-free. Nicotine causes uh, addiction, causes dependency, but is not the cause of uh, illness uh, related with tobacco. What the main cause is really combustion, is really burning the, the, the cigarettes. So based on this principle, actually, we said, of course, the best option, if you don't want to take any risks, is to quit smoking, is not to use anything. But the truth is, people will continue to smoke. People choose, and they have the right to, to make the, the, an informed choice to continue to smoke. So why don't give them a product that is better for them? Not risk-free. Risk-free is not to use anything, but a product that is better, better for them. So with this, actually, we... Uh, come up with four four platforms that you that you can see here. Actually, the most uh, famous one is the first one, which is Iti Tobacco, that is in Portugal very popular. In, in the world, we have now today more than 12 million users of this product, 12 million people that stopped smoking, and we can re really say this, they stopped smoking because these products don't generate smoke, they generate an aerosol, and this is the big difference, and move to this product. There's no uh, tobacco cessation uh, project or initiative that had these results as fast as, 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 as this uh, change uh, meant. Uh, so this is one, one key element of our transformation. Uh, another important point here is, and to make it more visual, is to see the impact of these products in air quality. In red uh, circles you see basically the effect of the toxicants in the air quality while using a cigarette. In the tiny blue ones you see that there is still something in the air is true, but much much uh, less significant than uh, combustible cigarettes, let's say. And one topic that, because we, we know and we are aware that we face a credibility issue because we are a, a tobacco company, this is also proven by independent uh, entities. So we have FDA saying, approving the commercialization of uh, heated tobacco in the US, saying that it's appropriate for public health protection. Can you imagine this? So appropriate for public health protection. And why? Because they realize that there are much less toxicants in this product than in conventional cigarettes. In FDA, we have Public Health England and many others. So this is not only our science, it's also others that are saying the same. Um, 
we'll, we also invest in other in other in other uh, points on sustainability. Of course, for example, youth access prevention is a very important topic for us. Very relevant discussion. We don't want that these products bring initiation to people that otherwise would not continue to smoke. So we never address minors. We never address non-smokers with all our communication. And this is very important for us. And we support any initiative or any government to uh, to prevent uh, use to access these products. And then many other many other points. For example, global equal salaries also that we were just certified is also uh, about sustainability. We also were certified with water. Uh, uh, usage uh, in our in our factories, although we're not an industry with a, a lot of water consumption, but this is also very important for us. So many many fronts. Uh, just to leave you in the in the final slide, that actually when we built all these all these um, uh, let's say science hub in Switzerland, we have we hired many scientists from life sciences. Actually, we discovered that. Uh, uh, what we had as a structure, we did a lot of studies. What is the impact, first of all, of new products? What is the impact of these products in the health of people? We did experiments in vitro, in vivo, uh, clinical studies. And for example, for the in vitro studies with cells, actually this can be applied for other sciences. For example, in studying the, the effects of Par Parkinson's disease and many others. So there's a lot of things that we built an infrastructure that actually can divert or use our science for something else that is very beneficial for society society and this is also about sustainability so in the in the future maybe we are turning into a tech company uh, and this is quite challenging for us we are used to be a very traditional tobacco company that used to be a place our products in the in the shelf of course informing about the risks of our product but we are going through a big big transformation and what we want to address is really that People need to be informed of science. We're talking about science here. There's a lot of misinformation around in the in the world about this. There's a lot of health authorities that defend one thing and health authorities that defend another thing. But we should stick to science. We should stick to, to, to the facts. And these 1 billion smokers in the world and the 2 million smokers in Portugal need to know this. They need to know that we have better products, better products for them than continued smoking. Thank you very much. Obrigada, Miguel. Um, and now, before giving the stage to Nick, I just want to remind the audience that uh, you have a QA and a live uh, that you can use in your app uh, if you want to make questions to the panel. And then if we have the time, uh, I will uh, select some of the, the questions uh, to, to our panel, okay? So just before Nick starts, Nick, Nick is an entrepreneur, a pioneer in tech for good. Uh, he is the founder of Ocean Mind, which is a non-for-profit uh, that uses big data and uh, artificial intelligence uh, in order to save the oceans. I think we can say that. So Nick is pretty much focused in SDG for, uh, 14 and is going to show us all about it. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. So just to, to illustrate, according to the latest United Nations figures, over 30% of the world's fisheries are overfished and unsustainable, and another 60% are fished to their maximum sustainable levels, meaning that they are sustainable, but only just. But these official figures don't take into full account levels of illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. And so the problem could be much worse than trends suggest. And over the past 40 years, seafood stocks have continued to decline. And the trend is alarming and the demand for seafood is only increasing. With 3 billion people in the world relying on seafood as their primary source of protein and 12% of the world's population relying on the seafood industry for their livelihood, we stand on the edge of a crisis. Ocean Mind is a not-for-profit organisation with the mission to empower enforcement and compliance to protect the world's oceans. Our work helps preserve marine biodiversity and protect livelihoods and to prevent slavery in the seafood industry. We use satellites and artificial intelligence to identify fishing activities and suspected non-compliance. The idea then is that we use technology to securely bring together many different data sources that we need to understand the compliance of fishing activities. 
So this would include vessel tracking data, satellite observations, local observations like port data or catch documentation, vessel registries and identities, fishing licenses, authorizations, and databases of thousands of fishing rules and regulations. We then use technology such as artificial intelligence and big data analytics to create alerts that our in-house experts can review and investigate and then we can deliver to authorities and seafood buyers actionable insights that include recommendations for how they can make a change. And in partnership with Microsoft, we've developed AI models that identify specific phishing behaviors and gear usage that's fed into our rules engine to automatically identify suspected non-compliance at scale. So to give you an idea of what some of these data sources look like, this is vessel tracking data visualized in our system. Here you can see hundreds of thousands of vessels around the world. The data source is a radio transmission from each vessel that's designed to stop them from crashing into each other. It just so happens you can pick that data up from space, but it's a very dirty data set. Um, the uh, transmission through the atmosphere is subject to corruption and also subject to manipulation by the vessel owners. It's also a huge data set with one vessel transmission data point every few seconds or maybe a few minutes for hundreds of thousands of vessels. So pulling all of this information together and then putting it in the context of regulations where you can see all the different coloured lines on that map show the different jurisdictional boundaries of different laws, different regulations to do with fishing activities. And you need to understand every single one of those to be able to judge the compliance. This then is a practical example of that vessel tracking data. This shows every vessel in 2018 that delivered tuna into Thailand. Tuna that was then turned into cans that you might have bought from the shelves of a supermarket. The government has to determine whether that tuna was caught legally or sustainably. And the question is, how would you do that? Well, you simply can't without these data analytics and the ability to bring big data together. The question then is, what do you do if you can't track the vessels? What do you do if you don't know where they are? Well, in that case, we turn to satellite data. This then is an image taken from a satellite radar capability called Synthetic Aperture Radar, where the satellites um, project radar to the planet's surface and then read the response. And this is very good at picking up the differences between, for example, large metal floating objects and the water around them. So you can see here in this image, little white dots all around the northern area where the vessels are waiting to go into a port. So now we can cross-reference that information with the tracking information and we can start to work out which vessels are which and which vessels are not transmitting. And that allows us then to investigate them. You can also get images from space, which we're all familiar with things like Google Earth. Um, and this image shows another uh, port estuary where you can clearly see the vessels going in and out. Um, and then you can analyse this behaviour. You can look at the wake patterns to understand what the vessels are and where they're doing. And again, you can cross-reference it with the tracking information. Uh, interestingly, this particular image is a free data image from the European Space Agency. Anyone can get images like these, analyse them using techniques such as Microsoft Cloud in order to be able to determine information about what's happening in the world. This is a higher resolution image. So this is, is a commercial image from a company called Digital Globe. This is um, what they call a 50 centimetre resolution image. So every pixel is 50 centimetres. And you can clearly see here that this is a transshipment at sea. This is two vessels coming together to transfer things between them. This was taken several years ago. The um, imagery you can collect today is twice as detailed as this now. And you can clearly make out different things going on on the deck of this vessel. You can identify um, different aspects of it, which allows you to start to judge which vessel it is, even though you might not have tracking information. And then there are capabilities on satellites to detect light sources. And the, the satellite is designed to map cloud cover by going over, looking down at clouds and seeing moonlight reflected off the back of clouds. But it turns out that when there's no clouds and there's no moonlight, you can see vessels on the uh, surface of the ocean. Vessels like this, they use the bright lights to attract fish to the surface. 
and you can see those lights from space. And so we bring all of this data together into a system in order to verify that the information provided by seafood suppliers um, is as they claimed it is and allow the supply chain and the buyers to tell that the claims are true and verify the sustainability and provenance of the fish. This verification can then be fed into traceability systems or linked with the seafood as it moves up the supply chain through the processing, through logistics and delivery to a retailer or restaurant. With this information, the retailer or restaurant can be sure that the seafood they're selling complies with all of the import regulations and is sustainable. And so by being able to bring this data together in platforms like Azure and apply data um, analytical techniques like Microsoft AI, we can speed up the understanding of the compliance of fisheries. And so the future of satellites and space services is more. They're going to be more satellites. There's going to be more sensors, better resolution sensors, and much, much more data. In the future, we will be able to see everything everywhere all the time. But analysing all of that data and making it useful to society will be impossible for human beings. And so artificial intelligence is essential to make sense of the data and understand what it tells us. But if we harness the power, we'll be able to monitor and therefore affect many more aspects of our planet. This data is available today to observe a great many of the threats to our planet. And with Microsoft Azure and Microsoft AI, we have tools that are ready made to make sense of the data so that we can plan our response and measure its effects. There is no time to waste, as we've already heard. The time to act is now. So with these tools available, you are now empowered to do something about it. Thank you. Obrigada, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Uh, so now, now we have uh, uh, some minutes for a debate. Um, it was fantastic, I think, to see uh, how uh, companies and other organizations finally are getting together in order to achieve the sustainable development uh, goals. Uh, and to see that those who created some of the problems are also those that probably can solve them. Uh, and now they can really solve them because the technology is here, the innovation is here. Uh, and so there's a bright future ahead of us. The first question, Kwame, is for you. You are a dreamer. Uh, and uh, I know you believe that we, we really will achieve the sustainable development goals by, by 2030. Uh, and what I would like to ask you is how does the future that you imagine uh, look like? Just uh, paint us a, pi a picture of the future you see, but in two minutes, okay? Uh, in two minutes, the future I see. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> The future I see uh, will have um, will have, I guess, a lot less products. Right now, we have like this product overload. There's there's too many things, um, and I think I think we will slow down a little in terms of the at least the future I want is not about products in between myself and my relations, in my relationships or in between myself and and the environment. It's really more about a deeper connection between myself. My family, my friends, my and 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 the world I inhabit, the, the, the you know the universe, the the, uh, the biosphere. So, I guess that's the future I would like. Um, I think it's really important to ask that question, and I don't think it's a question of technology, really. I think it's a question of mindset shift. If you don't shift your mindset from the very from a, from a very early stage, you're not going to be able to create the future you desire it's going to be a sequence of inevitabilities it's like yeah the phones are going to be smaller and cars will be driving us around and i will get an amazon shipment sorry a a, a delivery way before I, I i i actually utter those words that the, the shipment will be here so it's uh I think it's dangerous to just think about technology. I think first and foremost, you really need to think of what future do we want? And I think you asking most people, they aren't really going to talk about technology. They're going to talk about each other and how they want to hang out with each other, have more quality time. 
um, and especially in this beautiful country, right, uh, which is about quality of life, right? Um, and I, I, I think that's, that is the future I would want. And technology is like transparent. It's, it's just an enabling. Yeah, it's just it's making things happen. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, speaking about shifting, <clears throat> uh, when your grandfather created Delta almost uh, 40 years ago, almost uh, 60. Six, you know, okay, sorry. Uh, you could never imagine that the company would become an innovation technology driven company, I guess. Um, how does it happen? I mean, was that in your DNA or what was the driver behind this big transformation that Delta is undergoing? Well, tough question. I, I, think, I think it's a cultural thing. You know, we, we understand that in order to achieve our goals, innovation is really important. And I guess that in order to do all the things that we uh, talked about here today, innovation is important. And it, 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 not only technology, as you were saying, but, but innovation always in a ways of doing things, of partnering with, what, with others, trying to solve things, achieving things. So um, I guess it's really important if we want to move ahead. I mean, as a company, uh, to grow for one cent, but also to, to achieve uh, what we think that's our role as a company in the society. Because we need innovation to, to do things in a different way. I mean, it's not only uh, innovation, not only technology, yeah, it's also doing things in a different way. And that's why I was so interested in what Nathan was doing, because he was doing the right thing and it was really innovative. And it's not a technology thing, yeah? So uh, that, that is my next question. How did you meet? I mean, you, you were crossing the road and you saw Rui and you said, hello, I'm great. No. <laughs> Doing good things without, with coffee waste and you can help me. How, how did no, it happen? Um, I was lucky because I did my uh, master uh, here in, uh, in uh, Lisbon. And one of my professors is a friend of Rui. So he knew what I, what I was doing. I was doing that strange thing, you know, in that cave with mushrooms and coffee. And one day he came to Rui and said, yeah, I have this guy that is doing strange thing. Maybe it's nice that you meet him. <laughs> <laughs> and so we met, we had a coffee and uh, then Rui directly said, you yeah. You had we... a coffee, so coffee got you. Coffee exactly. <laughs> not a beer, a coffee. <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> Okay, and, and your experience in, in Portugal and in, in Lisbon, I mean, you are a foreigner, you are a very young uh, guy, sorry. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, are you staying for good in Portugal? Do you believe in this, that Portugal is the right country to develop such huge ideas as the one you are developing? Um, look, I never know what I'm going to be doing in 10 years, but for the moment, I truly believe that Portugal has a lot of uh, opportunities, especially with entrepreneurship, because um, Portuguese are really open-minded and uh, they want, they see change, obviously, like, like this panel, and uh, they want it to happen. So, yeah, definitely for the moment, it's the place to be. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, my next question is to Javier. Uh, we understand you are doing a, a lot in helping uh, companies saving uh, energy, saving water and, and so on. But I also understand that in order to do that, your clients also need to invest. Uh, how do you convince them to invest? Because first you need to, not to lose money, but to invest money yeah. in order to save money. And short termism is a great yeah. problem of most of the sea level guys so what is your secret <laughs> there is no secret but the, one of you can call it a secret is that we need to make two big drivers to match together one is environmental driver sustainability and one is economic driver that keeps moving the world so we call we call that we made up a concept called eroi so everybody's looking for return on investment. So we make that word that you mentioned, investment, to be real. So the opposite of investment is spent. So rather than being a cost, make it an investment. And then try to find ways to save cost linked to water reduction projects. So yeah, that's, that's how we try to do it. Okay, so the driver is saving. It's, the driver is, it's still about E&L. You have to find the savings. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
that's not such a good uh, uh, such a good uh, uh, thing because uh, I mean we we listen to a lot of sea level guys talking about purpose, but uh, at the end of the day, I also still believe that P and L still it drives them. It's a, a lot. way to go fast and smooth. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but it, if it's a way to get there, okay, no problem. Uh, Miguel. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I called you our anti-climax guy because you become from an industry uh, that is not consensual, is not uh, considered uh, to be, uh, I mean, a very sustainable industry, but you've shown us that even in these difficult industries, transformation towards a more sustainable way of doing things uh, is, is, is possible. But I, I also understand that this transformation is not consensual, Uh, across geographies and amongst uh, health and political authorities. There's a lot of, I mean, things in the newspapers and so on. Can you talk us a little bit about that? Or are you going to fire me because I'm asking you a difficult question? No, sure. I think I, for, for me it's uh, great to clarify because you're f totally right. There's so much information in the today about this topic. I mean... We have authorities in one country that support uh, non-combustible products, like I mentioned, US and uh, UK, for example. Then we have other authorities, for example, in Portugal that are having a different uh, position. So why, why is this happening? I really think the intention, or we, one point we all agree, the best is no, uh, no that someone that doesn't want to run any risks to use any product. But this is the big difference, is that We know by uh, practical terms, by observation, that people will continue to smoke. And that's the big difference, I think, that also health authorities sometimes uh, use uh, the public health instruments like prevention and cessation, and which is right, but that this will solve the issue. But it will not solve the issue because people will continue to have risk behaviors. People will continue to drink Thanks alcohol. Thanks, God. People Sorry, will continue sir. To <laughs> I like sausages. <laughs> yes, alcohol, fat foods. <laughs> sugar so acknowledging this is much better than ignoring it and that's that's the point uh, and so for these people that choose to have a more risky behavior knowing all the risks that they take they should be informed that there are products that are different from others and that's that's the uh, uh, very important point point. and just to let just to finish i think also media plays a very important role in the way they inform people, in the way information comes to people so that they make informed, informed choices. And we had recently a crisis in the end of last year with electronic cigarettes in the US that people that bought in the black market liquids that mixed uh, marijuana type of things. And then it was all over the news saying that these products are as bad as cigarettes or even worse, which is totally misleading people. The issue with cigarettes is combustion. And that's, that's, uh, that's uh, factual information. Yeah, so. That's it. I think we need to inform people. Okay, thank you. And uh, last, uh, last but not the least, Nick, uh, I was amazed with, with what you are doing. I, I think uh, most of the audience is. Uh, it looks very simple, but uh, it must be complicated. I mean, where does Ocean Mind get the satellite da data that you described from, uh, and how is information extracted from it? Because It's big data, but how do you turn it in, in something so usable and that makes the fish that gets into our plate be a more sustainable fish? So you're right, it is very complicated. Um, oh, it is? But, That's not good news. <laughs> but it is possible for, for anyone to get hold of this data and to start to make use of it. And there's a, a whole wealth of information out there for what to do with it. Um, the European Space Agency in particular has data sources of all types and varieties. So you saw one of the images, there's the radar data, there's um, planet sensing data, um, weather data, all sorts of things that you, you could use to better understand what's happening. And because it's being observed from space, you can get it for anywhere and you can get it um, throughout time. There is a, a huge back history as well. Um, and so although it is complicated and it does require some effort, it, it isn't unattainable and it is entirely possible for anyone with an idea, if only I could see that thing, 
to actually start to investigate how do I get that information? What does it look like? Who do I need to talk to, to the point of partnerships, to be able to get the knowledge from that piece of information so that I can then go and do something else in the world? And that is very straightforward. There's a huge range of potential partners to work with. Okay, thank you, Nick. Well, unfortunately, we are running out of time and the audience is also hungry and <laughs> leaving for, for lunch. But just one question from the audience. I would, uh, the question is, uh, if your employees are active agents of sustain sustainability, uh, and since we don't have time, I mean, to have everybody answering to this question uh, and about you, You, we know the answer about your, your employees, so you're out. <laughs> you don't have employees, you're out. Yep. Okay. Yep. You are a non-for-profit, you're out. <laughs> so I would direct the question uh, to Javier and Miguel. One minute. I mean, it's not just saying yes or no, but tell us the truth. You start? Go ahead. I can start. So the question is about employees. Yeah. Uh, with Are engaged. they involved in sustainability I mean, or this sure. is a sea level conversation? Uh, honestly, I think the secret or what we did very, very well and it's really working is that we started top down and we said we want to stop commercializing cigarettes. You know, and this is so powerful message that goes across everyone. Even someone in, the, in a factory, for example, in Tabacare that is producing conventional cigarettes today. You know, they know that actually our vision is something else, is to, to, to transform these products and convert as fast as possible people from smoking to, to, to smoke-free products. So this is really ingrained in everyone's mind. And then all the initiatives like uh, Equal Salary that we did, uh, like the Water Stewardship uh, Certification we also got, we are really, we are, we are really uh, focusing okay. sustainability is really one of our main goals. Uh, Javier, you just... I know we're running out of time, seconds. so I have plenty of examples in my mind that I will not use. I can only tell you that using that is the, the way we attract talent. So we, we want good talent and we don't get the good talent unless we offer that possibility. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Thank you so much. Thank you for resisting with hunger. Thank you so much.